Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, we recognize that you do indeed know all things. And then all of the prayer requests that we have mentioned, whether it be carpal tunnel surgery recovery or surgeries upcoming or getting over colds and sicknesses and general health, or whether it be the logistics of planning camp and having those who need to be there there, we recognize that in all those things you have a plan and your sovereignty is able to direct the circumstances of the individual's lives to be where they need to be to receive your grace. We also in that recognize our need to respond to you. And this evening as we turn our attention to your word, may we see that process once more as we recognize the leadership your Holy Spirit is to have in our life in teaching us the word. May we accept what he teaches us this evening, depend upon it, and better be able to allow, be used by him to contend for the faith as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome back to Jude chapter 1, 21. I erased our progress last week. If you remember, we got right here, two words. Uh, we did spend some time in review last week, and we're going to have to, to just touch on it. I won't spend time in it. We'll touch on it this week because Jude one twenty and Jude one twenty one are the same sentence, and so we need to make sure we have 20 in our thought process initially as well so that we can be accurate in context with what verse 21 is saying. So you should have verse 20 and 21 summary reviews. If you're in need of something, let me know now. 21? All right, we'll get you 21. In Jude 1.20, John, uh, Jude turns his attention to believers and their role in dealing with apostasy, the different things we need to do. And you'll notice that he does not tell us what to do to others first. He tells us what to do with ourselves first. And so we see the first protection from apostasy is given to us in verse 20 and 21. And we will get information from Jude concerning what we are to do in relationship to apostates, those who have departed from truth, whether they be in that apostasy because they're an unbeliever, or whether they be a believer who has bought a lie from Satan and company and have then departed from a right relationship with God. So that's the first focus for us, is what do we need to do as believers? And after that, we'll turn our attention in Jude 1, 23, or 22 and 23 to the two approaches to dealing with those who are not believers or those who are carnal believers. So in Jude 1, 20, I'll read verse 20 and 21. We'll touch base on what 20 said and then move into 21 for study this evening. Jude writes in Jude 1, 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously, for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Some of you will have to deal with waiting for eternal life, and we'll touch base on that when we get there. So hold that off for now. In Jude one twenty, what we saw was there were two things that we are to do as believers while we keep ourselves in the love of God. And we'll explain why that's the case when we get to this word, Teresate in verse 21 here this evening, but we had two specific commands in verse 20. The first one we were to do is to build ourselves up, and we saw that we are the ones who are to do the building. I gave you at that point a diagram which showed the structure of spiritual maturity and told you this one was still in progress. We have no verse references on here. Uh, they can be supplied. You can search them out yourself, but there's a process in which we as believers are built, and it starts first with the teachings of Jesus Christ about the Father. When you accept Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you are entered into a relationship with God the Father because he has birthed you spiritually from above. And as that being the case, you then need to learn who he is, learn his character, and learning his personality so that then you, as you walk with him, know who you're depending upon. And as you walk with him, you then learn, we saw when we went through the stages of spiritual maturity, you learn the policies and principles of God, then you learn how to depend upon those policies and principles reflexively, and then you start to grow in your understanding of who Jesus Christ is, not as your Savior, which got you into this 
whole game in the first place, but as your Lord, your master, the God of the universe. And so we are told in verse 20 to build ourselves up, and it says to do so, and it uses a phrasing in the most holy of the faith of you. When we studied that passage and that portion from the original text, we identified that the faith that you have is set apart for the work of depending upon the Holy Spirit as he teaches you the Word of God. That means for us that if we are going to perform the action to build ourselves up as a structure of spiritual maturity, that we have to depend in faith upon what the Holy Spirit teaches from the Word of God. The Word of God is the focus for the believer in the church age for his growth spiritually. What you know about the Word of God and what you accept from the Word of God and what you depend upon the Word of God will be the basis for your spiritual growth. Now we have a problem initially because we cannot, as we expressed before we began, we cannot understand the things of God if we are carnally oriented, if we aren't in a right relationship with Him. So we have to deal with our sin in our walk with God. I remember, I remind you of Peter and Jesus' discussion when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Jesus said, not even to the end, or Peter said, not even to the end of the ages will you have the potential to wash my feet to Jesus. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you can have no part with me. And Peter responds, well, don't just wash my feet, then wash all of me. Well, then Jesus turns the tables on him once more and says, well, if you've had a complete bath already, the one who has been bathed completely already does not need to have a complete bath. He just needs to have the dirty part of him washed. And Jesus had told him already, Peter, you don't know what I'm teaching you, but you will hereafter. And what he was teaching was the concept that we are clean, perfectly righteous in our position in Christ. But as we walk with God in that relationship we have, we trespass and we get our feet dirty. Fellowship, separation. As a child disobeys their parents, they stop following the leadership of the parents, and there has to be restoration. That's the picture. So we have had a complete bath. If we've trusted Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we are not needing salvation again, but we do need to maintain that relationship we have through 1 John 1, 9, confessing our sin to him. And so if we are to build ourselves up, we have to do so, it says, by faith. And faith was the instrument. We use faith to be the thing that builds us up, but faith requires that we are depending upon something else. Otherwise, it's works. You're sitting in a chair. You're depending upon that chair to hold you up. I am standing up. I am depending upon my muscle, muscular skeletal system to hold me up. Whatever you depend upon has to do what you expected it to do. If my legs grow faint and my muscles can't support me, then I'll drop to the floor. You guys, I'm hoping, would then rush to me and find out what's going on. If your chair breaks, you would probably get up and get a new chair. I would rush to you, by the way, just in case you were curious. Find out if you're all right. The point is you have to depend upon something to support you. For you sitting, for me standing, we're depending upon different things, but they're doing the work we trust them to do. God gave us grace that says to trust what he has provided for salvation. That's Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty. If we trust on that and Jesus does that work, then we're covered. We're taking care of our sins are paid forever. If we trust in Jesus Christ, but he didn't die on the cross on our behalf or didn't raise from the dead or didn't fulfill any of a number of prophecies concerning him, well, then our work would be, our trust in him would be futile because the works wouldn't be there. And Paul speaks the same things. It's about the dependency you place on someone else to do something on your behalf. And so faith is the tool that we use to build ourselves up spiritually. And what is it that we then depend upon? Well, we depend upon the Holy Spirit who teaches us what? The Word of God. And it's the Word of God that transforms our thought process that then goes into our beliefs, where the Bible calls our heart, and that is what changes us. So building yourselves up is accomplished by the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry where when you place yourself in fellowship with the Father through confession of sin and he takes care of that trespass in your relationship, the Holy Spirit then teaches you what the Word of God says. You're able to understand the Word of God because you're spiritual in your thought process rather than carnal. And you submit to the Holy Spirit's leadership, accept what he says, even the teaching lesson he gives you. You may want to learn about something else, but he has something specific for you to learn. 
excuse me, learn. And so accepting his teaching lesson for that day or that moment is a part of this. So building ourselves up is through our dependence upon the Holy Spirit as he teaches the Word of God. You've got to have the Holy Spirit teaching the Word of God that you then depend upon to do the work of you building yourself up. So we look at that and we go, well, then I guess we don't really do the building, do we? No, our role in the building really is just trusting, Jesus, trusting the Holy Spirit to do it. And that's where the command comes in for us. We then see also and saw also praying, that we are to pray. And we saw this was prosukamai, which, or prosukamanoi, which means to ask a superior for your desired object or thing. And so if we are asking our superior, that's the Father, we can go to him because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We ask him for what we want, not what's rightfully ours. James 1.5 says, if anyone, asks, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he will give to him without reproach. And the word ask there means to ask for what's rightfully yours. As a child of God, wisdom is rightfully yours to ask for. We need to study that to see exactly what's being said there. But there are things that are ours that God has given us as, as his children. There are things that we want that God can or cannot give us, may or may not give us. And so this one is speaking specifically to just your desires. And here's what we learned in that, is that when you're going through your day, if you're walking with God, your desires that you have, you then send to the Father. Father, I'd like to know if I can go do this. I'd like to know if this is going to be the case. You don't expect it, but you ask for it. Why? Because you recognize it's the Father from whom all good things are given, and he is the one to whom you're supposed to make your request. But when we're walking out of fellowship with God in carnality, what do we do with our desires? We take them for ourselves. I want this, and I'm not getting it. And that wages wars within relationships and within our own members of our body, and we end up even to the point of going to murder. James chapter 4. So we've seen these two things already, verse 20. But verse 20 is a part of verse 21. They're the same sentence. And the main point, the main verb in the sentence is that word keeping. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. That's the main thrust of what Jude is saying here. And while we keep ourselves in the love of God, we will be being built up by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, which we depend upon in faith. And while we are keeping ourselves in the love of God, we will be making our requests known to the Father rather than trying to secure them for ourselves. And that's where we pick up the study this evening as we work through the language of the New Testament to identify the different relationships between things, the mechanics about how to go about doing things uh, from the grammar. And so we'll pick up in Jude one twenty one at this point. Remember, we're talking to believers, and Jude now tells them, yourselves... Hey, Autus, you are to keep in the love of God. The Greek word order and the English word order are different. That's why on your summary review, you've got the interlinear format, which is the Greek with the English on top, underneath it. We'll explain the words in red along the way, as is our custom. But we need to recognize a few things about this word, hey, Autus. Yourselves is reflexive, meaning that you do this reflecting back to you. There's that old phrase that children used to use, I'm the rubber, you're the glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. That's, that's a reflexive behavior. Whatever that person does, it reflects back to them. That's the concept. So you are here, as a believer, you are the subject. You're the one who's doing the keeping of yourself in the love of God. And you are also the recipient. Your actions are reflected back to you so that you're the object that receives the keeping. You are, in fact, the direct object of this verb to keep. And so the syntax of this, the way the words relate to each other, identifies that what the object that you're keeping is yourself. So you perform the action to keep you, the object, and we're going to see that word means to keep watch over, and it's talking about maintaining yourself within the right relationship with God, ultimately. Yourselves, and it's masculine, identifying the role of initiation. We are to initiate this keeping of ourselves in the love of God. That's a volitional expression for us. We are to choose to maintain ourselves in the love of God, which means when we sin, we confess. 
While we're walking with him, we maintain that relationship through submission, through willful obedience to him. So you are the object that is kept in the love of God, and you are the one who does the keeping. Now this brought up a question for us last week that led us to the prodigal son, and we're going to try and clarify this as we go throughout the difference between us being separated from the love of God, which is in Christ, and us keeping ourselves within that love of God in our walk with him. And we're going to break that down throughout our translation here. Now, yourselves, the object that you have, is to be kept in a location. The preposition N is used with the locative case of agape, which we translate simply as love. We'll explain that one when we get there. Yourselves in the location of, which comes from this locative right here. It denotes the location of an object or an action. And here you're going to find that the action is accomplished upon the object within this location, the love of God. So it's in the love of God. We're going to draw a circle. There's boundaries to this. That you are to keep yourself. This is the picture that the locative case in the form of that word love gives. There's a location in which the love of God is and which you are to keep yourself. And the word love from agape is what we would simply summarize as self-sacrificial or unconditional love. We have spent time through 1 John chapter 4 and throughout early the whole book of 1 John extracting from this word what its meaning really is. Getting a lengthy definition of it. So much so that every time we saw the word love, we just said, okay, you know the definition. We're going to just tell you it's unconditional and you can look back at the notes later. The love of God here identifies a self-sacrificial love that continues to give regardless of of the response that it receives from the person or thing being loved. And it continues to give to that thing, regardless of how of the response it receives, based on the needs of that individual, or in response to the needs of the individual, and based on the character or integrity of the one who's doing the loving. In other words, this is I love you for who I am, not I love you for who you are. Personal love says I love you because of who you are and what you do. But unconditional love says, I love you because of who I am. I will choose to pursue what's best for you, regardless of what you do to me, whether you accept it, reject it, ignore it, or live on the other side of the planet. It's not based upon the other person at all. It's based on their needs. What does that individual need? Well, God reveals that to us if we're walking with him. Otherwise, we're left to our thoughts, and that person may need a good smackdown is what we think oftentimes. <laughs> but I'd remind you that our ways are not God's ways, nor are our thoughts his thoughts. And so we are to become kind to one another, forgiving one another just as God in Christ Jesus forgave us, so that we can give what is graciously needed to those in their situations. And Ephesians 4, 26 to 31 spells this process out for us regarding anger and forgiveness in that. Self-sacrificial love which manifests itself in giving regardless of the response it receives based on the integrity or because of the integrity and volition of the one loving based on a response to the needs of the individual. Or 
for the one being loved. You can see why we just say unconditional love. Self-sacrificial love, which manifests itself in being given regardless of the response it receives because of the integrity and volition of the one loving based on response to the needs of the one being loved. And you can take love, loving in there, and identify that means to pursue what's best for the other. Husbands, we are to love our wives in this way. Wives, you actually are not commanded to love your husbands in this manner. You're commanded to have a responsive love that responds to his needs. Um, again, needs, not wants. And God determines those needs, not the husband. Uh, but based upon that, we have different roles as husbands and wives. Now, the love is indeed the love of God. Genitive case of theu, the word for God, describes possession. So it identifies that the love is God's love. We are to keep ourselves in this location of God's love. Now, how can we separate ourselves from the love of God? I thought Paul made it pretty clear in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 to 39, where he says, For he has become convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of God. So how is it that we get a command to keep ourselves in the location of the love of God? Well, I've left off a part of that word teresite until this point. The word teresite means to keep watch over something. To keep watch over something. When we trust Jesus Christ to be our Savior... We are taken out of condemnation and placed in Christ. This is what we call our position. This is positional truth. You are in Christ. And Titus 2.14 says that he has reserved for himself a people for his own possession or a peculiar people. The word literally means a dot encompassed by a circle. The dot is the believer. He's surrounded by Christ. And the, the word periusion from which this diagram comes identifies that a dot is secure within that location, the boundaries of something else, but it's also owned by that thing. Whatever is this circle owns whatever's in it. So we belong to Christ, we are in him, and he protects us. The only way for us to lose our salvation at this point would be to leave that position, but he's the one who protects us. Holy Spirit in Ephesians in fact, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 gives us a, a massive list of what belongs to us as believers in Christ, our position. The Holy Spirit seals us in Christ until we get to what we call the day of redemption. And so it's important for us to recognize that there is a difference in our position then and our walk. Our walk is our experience, and so it's called experiential truth. In Christ, we have the love of God. Love of God is in Christ Jesus. That's where we are at. So the love of God does not leave Christ Jesus, that location. We don't leave Christ Jesus. We are always in and with the love of God. But in our relationship, we sin. And in that sin, we have the opportunity then to confess. Sin takes us out of a right relationship with God, but yet we are secure in our position in Christ because that's guaranteed by God. This is based upon us walking with him. And when you see experiential truth taught primarily in 1 John 1, 5 through 10, also John 13, uh, verses 1 through about 10, but you'll have to truncate the 10 probably. This is the washing of the disciples' feet. Um, and then experiential truth is taught all throughout the New Testament from Acts 2 through Revelation 5.14. We see experiential truth being a large focus of the believer. And we're seeing it here again in Jude one twenty one, which focuses on the keeping watch over ourselves within the love of God. We have a relationship with God positionally. Our status 
in that relationship is either in obedience, in a right relationship with him, or in disobedience. And if we are in disobedience, and having a disobedient relationship with God, we still have a relationship. But we're not in a right relationship. We have rejected the authority that God the Father is as our Father for something else that we have said now gets to dictate what we do. So we take that bait in the trap, we leave fellowship with God, oneness with God through different types of testing where we, in which we fail, and at that point we have to deal with this confession concept. Now in all of this, Romans 8, 39, Romans 8, 38 and 39, teaches us that the love of God is not contingent or based upon us walking with him. It's based upon us in being in Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God's love is here. If you are here, you also are with God's love always. Nothing will separate you, no manner of life. Nothing you can do in this life. No manner of death, suicide even, can't take you away from the love of God. Once you're in Christ, that love of God, and you go the same place where Christ goes positionally. In your walk with God, however, you have to maintain that relationship. And our focus is to maintain ourselves walking within the confines of God's love, not within the confines of his discipline. Discipline for the believer is outside of fellowship with God. This is God's perfect leadership, where he leads us by the Holy Spirit and his word. And so this word to keep watch over means to take care of the needs of something, to protect that thing, so that nothing happens to it. It's the same word used when we have reference in Scripture to soldiers keeping watch over their prisoners or shepherds keeping watch over their flocks. It's based upon the needs of that individual or that object. What is it the shepherd needs to do for the sheep? What is it that the prison guard needs to do for the prisoners? Well, what is it you need to do for yourself? And the only thing we can do for ourselves is confess our sin. When we do that, he restores us to fellowship with him. Keeping watch over ourselves means that we are riding herd around our walk with God. We are taking stock of the stock and where our thought process has gone, where our actions are going, and whether or not we are within the relational structure that we have of obedient children with God. We're keeping watch over that. So that when we see temptation testing come our way and the bait is laid in the trap like Tom and Jerry lay bait in traps for them. When we see that bait in the trap, we go, I am being tempted here. I have something that's trying to take me away from the love of God to give me something that is not based upon his love, but based upon this world. And I reject the bait because I'm watching over my relationship with God. I'm maintaining myself in his love. So the separation from God's love is never possible, but the maintaining of yourself within that love is up to you. And you are an initiator. You must choose to fulfill this command, and this is where the fun really begins. Te reisete means to keep watch over in its root form, but we have an imperative mood here, which is the mood of command. When we see the imperative mood in Koine Greek, it gives us a command that issues a challenge to you. If you're a believer in Christ, you are challenged by this command to do what it says. And so when you have a command that challenges your personal volition, you now know that you are to keep watch over, to ride herd on your relationship with God. And as something tries to kick on out of the herd and out of the group, you bring it back in by dealing with it. How do you deal with it? Confession of sin. And you put it back in the right relationship. God takes care of that for you through your confession. And you live what, the, what Ephesians says, circumspectfully being careful so that you redeem the time, not wasting any time chasing down that lone cow that you, of temptation that you let out and it's now three miles away from the herd that you've got to bring back in and confess. The best way to keep a herd together is to confess your sin immediately. The best way to keep a herd is when you see that first cow or whatever it may be that you're riding herd over, when you see it start to venture off, you get a horse, you get a quad, you get something over there to put it right back in the fold. And that's what makes the herd continue to go. 
We've had the, the blessing and the benefit of having cows at our house the last five years. And one of my favorite things is when the fence breaks. <laughs> I just prefer it doesn't happen at 5.30 in the morning when I'm dressed in my suit to come to a Thursday morning study. <laughs> That's happened before in the tall hay grass. <laughs> But I like it because it reminds me of this, plus I, I always said I should have been a cowboy. That was a song I actually tried to use for my baptismal service. I was, should have been a cowboy. I was five at the time, my, to best of my recollection. They said, no, please choose something else. Maybe I should have been a cowboy instead, I don't know. But the idea with the cows is when you have 13 steers and you're trying to get to the next pasture, you've got to keep them moving as a group. And if one stops, Guess what's going to happen to the others over time? You're going to split the group up to you have two, or if it's that lead steer, it's going to take everyone else. They're all going to stop. It stops the momentum of getting that herd to the pasture you're trying to get them to. When our relationship with God, our thoughts essentially are the cattle. They're the herd. Whatever takes our attention away and gets us to say, no, I'm going this way, we have to change, change that thought process immediately in order to keep momentum going the right direction. And if we don't, let, don't take care of that one cow that spurted out and we keep driving the herd, we're going to have something out here that's dangling out. And oftentimes what's going to happen is if you don't deal with it right away but then try and go deal with it afterwards, then another cow spurts out and they start splintering off. And guess what? You've got no momentum now. You've got a massive rodeo to deal with. And you've got to get them all grouped back together because you have to keep watch over that herd as you drive it where you're going. And whatever they do, you have to respond in that situation. You can't just say, well, I'm taking you over here and you best come with me. No, if that thing squirts out of there, you've got to go chase it down. If sin squirts out, you've got to confess it and get it back dealt with so that you continue your spiritual momentum. That's keeping yourself in the love of God. But waiting to use cows as an analogy for something someday, and that just was perfect. Ah. Huh. Five years of my, my cowboy playing. <laughs> that, that is exactly the concept. As sin and testing and temptation volitionally challenges us and we re reject God's love for whatever is out here, we've got to ride herd on it. Confess it and take care of it. This is the first real statement of Jude 1, 20 and 21. This is the main thrust of it. Ride herd. Keep watch over yourselves in the love of God. Take care of your relationship with God. And whatever pops up, whether you expected it to, think it should have happened or not, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. If we allow something besides the Holy Spirit and God's Word to lead us, and by the way, they work together. I don't mean the Holy Spirit or God's Word. I mean the Holy Spirit and God's Word to lead us then we're going to be operating carnality faster than we can blink. And if we don't deal with that, we'll have a whole rodeo in our life. Discipline of God is going to be what's leading us to recognize that sin. The Holy Spirit will switch from teaching us to convicting us of our sin, showing proof. See, Cal, I was trying to take you over there, and you went this way. You want to see the video of it? We'll replay it. Shows that proof, you, you confess it and move on. You have been given a command from God's word here now, and I have been able to bring you down with me because now that you know it, you're responsible to do it. You all, believers, are commanded, imperative mood, active voice, to perform the action. What is the action? Well, it's done in a point in time. Which point in time? As many points in time as it takes to keep watch over yourselves in the love of God. That is a busy word. Have you ever done a cattle drive? <laughs> it's a busy time. <laughs> But are we this busy? Not if we're honest. We should be. And how do we know we should be? Well, because we were told to by the Father, as he teaches us through the Word. Now, what do I mean when I say this, is it, this challenges your personal volition? God gave humans free will. Personally, and I'm wrong, 
I think it's one of the worst things he could have ever done. The reason I'm wrong is because that's from a human perspective. Because what do people do with their free will? They abuse it. They tear others down. They take for what they want. They eat fruit from a tree. They can eat anything in the garden. Don't eat this one fruit. Well, you could be like God. I'll take that one, thank you. But God did give us free will, and clearly he knows better than us because it's with that same free will that can be our downfall, that can be what gets us back into the right relationship with God or accepts the gospel to begin with to birth us spiritually from above by the Holy Spirit. It's all in how you use it. I've prayed many times, as I've said to you before, Father, just take away my free will, just put me in your directed will, leave me in there, and let's just directly go through everything you want. The problem is he can't direct me if I can't respond to him. <laughs> but he can control me if I'm willing to let go of the things I want. To maintain myself, to keep watching myself within the Holy Spirit's control. Where he controls us by us yielding our free will, our desires, to him so that he carries out the Father's will through us. There's a picture that we see clearly in Scripture, specifically Acts 2 through Revelation 5.14, the church age teachings, that identifies that the only job we as believers have is to keep watch over our relationship with God. That's it. We build ourselves up by trusting someone else to do the building. We grow spiritually by depending upon the Word of God in our thought process. It does the change. We don't change ourselves. It changes us. Building ourselves up by means of the faith which was set apart for that role as the believer. We do that while we obey this command to keep ourselves in the love of God to keep watch over ourselves. Your job is to be responsible to God and no one else. This is the most freeing thing I think you can find on the face of the planet. You are not beholden to the desires, the wishes, or the thoughts of other people. You are, however, beholden to God's thoughts, desires, and objective for you. Now, as a husband and a father, God tells me I am to take care of my wife to put her needs above my own, which means that what her needs are have to become greater than my own desires and needs. As a father and a parent, my job is to take care of the children, to teach them, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord as a leader of the house. It's not on my wife to do it, it's on me to do it. And we play a role together in that. But the only reason that I have those responsibilities is because it matters what I do in front of God. I teach the youth oftentimes that your job is to obey your parents, not because they're your parents, but because God's God and he is on the throne. It's because he says obey your parents that you're to obey the parents. So ultimately, you're not really focused on obeying your parents. If you're thinking about it the right way, you're focused on obeying God and doing what he says. And if you're doing what he says, you will obey your parents. The only focus for us as believers is to deal with this bottom circle. Did I sin? I did confess. Oh, two seconds later, I just did the same thing again. Confess it. Move on. Press on toward the goal. Keeping yourselves in the love of God. And while we do that, the Holy Spirit works upon us to orient our thought process towards what's coming for us as believers. We're going to get what's coming to us, specifically eternal life. Now, wait a second. I thought John 3.15 teaches us that we have eternal spiritual life the moment we believe. It does. This is talking about the moment that we enter into eternal spiritual life, not the moment we possess that life for ourselves. And so we're going to get through that if I can get off of this riding herd concept. I told you I should have been cowboy. It's still in my head. You all are commanded to keep watch over yourselves. You do the work to keep watch over you, the object. You're the herd, and as you drive that herd, maintaining it, all you're, all you're supposed to do is keep the herd together. Confess your sin. That's it. 
God takes care of the rest. You confess your sin, get in a right relationship with him, Holy Spirit takes control. He takes the leadership. The cattle and the herd analogy then become your thoughts, your desires, your actions, all the different things that are a part of you and your personality that you are to keep oriented in the right place through purely recognizing you're responsible to God. And if somebody doesn't like what you do because you're following God, oh well. You have a responsibility to follow Him, not to please others. The only reason we please others is when God tells us to do so. And He lays that out for us in our relationships. We spent time looking at the flesh, where we saw that this society manipulates others by their area of strength, which causes them to want to please people and return for a good opinion. We care not of the opinion of others, what we should care far more so is the opinion of God, who loves us regardless of whether we're obeying him or not, but who disciplines us when we're not into that behavior that benefits us, still loving us, not throwing the book at us, which he could rightfully do as a sovereign God, but loving us because he is love. You yourselves in the location of self-sacrificial love of God you all are commanded to perform the action at a point in time to keep watch over. All this is saying to you is in dealing with apostasy, your job is to make sure you don't go apostate yourself by some sort of false teaching coming into your thought process and to make sure that when you sin, you confess and get back in fellowship. That's it. The best, dealing, the best approach to dealing with apostasy for the believer is to maintain yourself in a right relationship with God. Galatians chapter 6 says, You who are spiritual, restore such a one, keeping watch over yourselves, lest you also become carnal. <laughs> this isn't talking about giving the gospel message. This is talking about a, a believer to another believer who's left fellowship with God and is living outside of that fellowship and outside of a right relationship with God. You've got to make sure that when you attempt to assist them as a brother picking up the slack and giving them grace, that you don't let them sink your ship. We've heard about sinking ships before, haven't we? Early part of Jude, apostates are rocks in the harbor that are hidden just beneath the surface, capable of sinking ships. Paul talks about some who have been shipwrecked in their faith. They've come across apostasy and it broke them. It stopped them from keeping watch over their relationship with God, their emotions, their response to it, whatever took them up outside of their relationship with God, and they remained carnal. This is going to happen to us. We are going to face in this world tribulation, trouble. That's a given. Do we let that trouble sink the ship? Or do we ride herd over it? Deal with our emotions in it. Put them in the proper orientation. Deal with the injustice, perhaps, whether perceived or actual, that we've felt. And put it in the right perspective knowing that our job is just to maintain ourselves before God. We do that, he takes care of the rest. That's why we say we live by faith, dependence upon God to work through us as we walk with him. Prosdecamenoi describes believers as being oriented toward receiving something. And it's a present tense participle. Which means while you are keeping yourself, keeping watch over yourself, this will also be happening simultaneously. This is why we look at the language. Because it gives us insights like this we can't get from English. And I'm not saying the English translations are bad, they're great. But we see more when we see the way that God has used the syntax of the original languages here. The main verb is aorist tense. The Present tense participle identifies that in that moment where you keep watch over yourself, you are also simultaneously sending your... That's the other part of the verse. That's verse, nine, verse 20. You are simultaneously oriented toward receiving the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. Prosdecamenoi, a compound word, means to take hold of... Or to receive something. Deca... Dekao, I guess would be the verb form, means to receive something. Pros is a, a preposition that means oriented towards something or facing towards something. You're looking towards something. 
And so when you combine the two together, the idea that you have here is that you are fo focused on receiving something. This is your thought process. So now while you keep yourself in the love of God, you're focused by someone else toward receiving the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I keep saying by someone else? Well, we have a middle passive participle. The middle passive identifies that you place yourself into a position where someone else does the work of the verb. Now, wait a second. We keep talking about circles and diagrams like this. We just said that if you're going to keep watch over yourself, that you're going to be maintaining your relationship with God so that when you sin, you also then confess. What does that do? It puts you back in fellowship with God. And while you're back in fellowship with God, the Holy Spirit controls you. Ephesians 5, 17. Do not be drunk with wine, for that's dissipation, but be ye saturated to the point of control. Wow, the King James slipped in there too. You got that ye in there? Be ye. Be ye saturated to the point of control by the Holy Spirit, or by means of the Holy Spirit. You can, when sin takes you out of fellowship with God, you confess it, you're back under the control of the Holy Spirit for that brief moment that you stay in fellowship with Him, however long or short that moment may be. But if you're keeping watch over it, when you leave, you're going to be dealing with this. But when you put yourself here through confession, you are putting yourself in the place where the Holy Spirit does the work to orient you toward receiving the love of, or the mercy of God. Do you see the life of faith that we are to have as believers? We trust God to do the work he says he will do. The only thing that keeps him from being able to do that work in our life is the free will he gave us. Why doesn't he just do it anyway? Because he's righteous. And that wouldn't also be love. That would be forcing his will upon us rather than saying, this is what's best for you. You shall receive it and take it based on your will. When we force our will on someone else, that's not love. In the area of the physical relationship or sexuality, we call that rape. But we can do that in the area of interacting with one another besides that physical or sexual concept. When we say, I want this for you, I'm going to make this happen, we're putting our agenda, our desires, our will into someone else's life. And that's not love. Now, as husbands and fathers, how do we deal with that? Because we have a standard in the Word of God that we are to maintain our house in a certain manner. We have a standard with our, parents, our children that we are to maintain our children in a certain manner. But you know what? That standard's not the point. Maintain our relationship with God is the point. Because when we do that, what happens? We maintain the standard righteously and graciously, not demanding it as a clanging symbol in the marketplace where a merchant goes through and 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us the idea that without operating in love, wait, where do we operate in love? In fellowship with God. Without operating in love, we're a clanging symbol. And that phrase in the Greek identifies a merchant going through, clanging on his symbol so that the people have their attention drawn to him. And he says, I've got stuff to sell you. Keeping ourselves in the love of God as husbands and fathers means that we will not be forcing our agenda or the standard that is rightfully there upon others. We maintain the standard. We don't ignore it and let it slide. We don't force it through, through an agenda-based legalism. We maintain ourselves in the love of God. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit leading us by our voluntary submission to Him will maintain the standard and show us how to lovingly and graciously and righteously Love our wives and lead our children. Prosdecamenoi means that we put ourselves in the place where someone else acts upon us. Someone else does the action to orient us toward the mercy that is ours as believers. But it's masculine, meaning it's based on our own initiation. If you don't Put yourself in the place where the Holy Spirit can orient you toward the mercy that belongs to you as a believer in Christ. The rapture is the focus here. If you don't put yourself in that place, the orientation is not going to take place. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's job at that point is to get you to put yourself here by convicting you of your sin. And the Father will lead him to discipline you 
And the screws of discipline will tighten and tighten and tighten until you get to the place where at some point you've got to stop resisting the discipline. And we get that as 1 John 5 teaches us all the way down to the point where if God in his omniscience knows that regardless of any more discipline he applies, we will not accept that discipline and confess and, and repent and move on, then he'll take us home. Notice he takes us home and not gets rid of us into the lake of fire or to torments. Prosdeca Manoi means to orient towards something. And I think, I'll try to be consistent here with what we put on your expanded translation. The simultaneous aspect is expressed through the word while. Keeping watch over yourselves while. Continuously. Participating in being acted upon by another. The another here is the Holy Spirit. Participles identify principles, meaning that while you are keeping yourselves in the love of God, you will be oriented. It's a spiritual law of operation. Act upon by another as a matter of principle. To be oriented toward something. We would then at this point look for a direct object, which we have over here, the accusative, translated simply into English as mercy. The Holy Spirit orients you toward mercy, but specific mercy is in view. You put yourself in the place where he can direct you in your focus toward the reality of eternal life ahead. Now, this manifests itself in a couple of ways. It doesn't mean your thought process is constantly, the rapture's coming. Because you also are working to maintain yourself in a relationship with God. You can't just be only thinking the rapture's coming, but also ignoring that you have a role to play as his ambassador. They work together. But that manifestation is reminding yourself, it manifests itself but through a reminder that what goes on in this world is not the final place for you. We, we say this often, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> that's the concept. All that's going on around this world, plagues, well, we're not plagues. We got COVID nineteen, just nothing. It's a flu. It's a common cold. Earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, tornadoes. Those that's something. Tornadoes are something. All these things in this world are in this world, including the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. When we're focused on the spiritual realities of things, we're not focused here on the here and now in the world. We're focused on walking with God. Our focus is on maintaining that relationship so that he can accomplish what he wants through us in spite of what's going on in this world. So this being oriented toward the mercy of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ, is recognizing that we keep and have this focus kept in us that there's a spiritual world and reality around us that is not this physical world. We rise then above this physical world in spiritual understanding. So the things of this physical world, the opinions of people, the actions of natural circumstances, the consequences of political actions or whatever, they don't have any bearing on us. Why wouldn't they have any bearing on us? Because our only focus is to keep watch over ourselves. And when we do that, our focus is on the spiritual world, not the physical world. And we recognize that there is a mercy to come. So in spite of whatever may happen in this world, which is designed to kill you, I mean, let's be honest. There are only a few people who have left this world alive. One of them had to die before he did so. The only thing for us is to focus on as believers is to keep ourselves in the love of God. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a relationship. Walk in that relationship. We're going to have to wrap this up at this point. We're going to explain, picking up here in Prost Decamanoi, the next time that we meet, which should be about two weeks away.
Uh, no, we won't, because that will be also, we'll be, we're three weeks out on this now. We've got prayer service next week, and the 22nd is our, we're coming back from camp. My wife and I will be traveling over to go pick up our daughters uh, to Idaho, or from Idaho. I'll give you a, a brief synopsis as we wrap this up, and then we'll deal with the, the words on the board next week, or next time we meet. The mercy that we are awaiting currently is the return of Christ. And when we see him in the air, we will know him and we will know what we shall be. And as we go up into heaven with him, we will receive through the purification process a glorified body. That is the realization of our eternal life. From that point on, we will be in the bodies that we will be in in eternity. And as we come back and reign on this earth with him, in a thousand year time period, we will do so as eternal beings, not subject to the time. We'll be above that time, even though it's going along and we're experiencing it. We're outside of the bounds of time. So what we find then is that we as believers are waiting for that moment where we no longer have to keep watch over ourselves because the sin nature is removed from us and we're outside of this world system. That for believers takes place at the rapture. When we go through the judgment seat of Christ and our works are evaluated and we get that body that we call our glorified body. We talk about justification in the sense of positional, experiential, and ultimate. Justification means being made right with God. You are made right with God the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ to be your Savior. Experientially, as you walk with God and confess your sin, your relationship is made right once more. And as you come to this place of ultimate justification, when you die, you'll be ultimately made right, where you cannot be made wrong again. It's three parts, positional, experiential, and ultimate. Eternal life for us is the same thing. We have eternal life, positionally, John 3.15, the moment of belief. We have a participle identifying that simultaneous to our belief, we possess eternal life. Experientially, 1 John 1, 5 through 10, teaches us walking in fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as he himself is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the love of God, or the, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us. And it's talking about this continuously doing the cleansing work. And, but we also have this ultimate possession of eternal life. Oh, during that time, we experience that spiritual life that we have. But the ultimate for us is at the rapture, where we receive our glorified body. Paul speaks to this in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and we see it when we talk about the snatching away or the taking away of the saints, where something acts upon you to remove you from your lo location, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ who returns in the air and the blink or the twinkling of an eye. We will deal with these things coming up, but having that mercy for us, we have it currently in the form of possessing spiritual life. We have it experientially in the form of walking in that spiritual life, but there will be come a day where it is ours in our, ex not just our experience, but ultimately and completely. That moment where we leave the finitude, the finitude of this world, and enter into the infinitude of eternity. We'll deal with that in two weeks, or should that mercy come before that? Dare I ask for any questions? Apostasy is dealt with by riding herd. When someone acts towards you in a way that they should not, when you act in a way that you should not, when temptation overtakes you, even though it should not, ride herd. That deals with the, the departure from truth. And that's it. God takes care of the rest. If there's no other questions or statements, then we will pray and dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have provided to us all that we need that you continue to pursue what's best for us as your children, even if that's discipline because of our carnality. But that in giving us your word and the Holy Spirit to teach us, that you provide for us also what we need to depend upon or to be built up as a spiritual being, 
growing spiritually, establishing that, that spiritual structure of maturity, that you give us also all that we need to accomplish those things during our experience here on earth that you designed us to accomplish. May we walk faithfully, accomplishing those works beforehand that you prepared for us by maintaining ourselves in the love of God, the love that you have for us, keeping watch over our relationship with you that we operate in your love and not just abuse your grace, taking for ourselves what we want instead. What a wonderful thing you've given that we may be called your children and may we go out from this place encouraged and focused to maintain ourselves within that relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.